This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 988, recorded on Wednesday, September 25th, 2024. Slap Fight Science Night. Hey, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with a slap fight, cannibalistic queen ants, and mile-high microbes. But first... Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Much of the world is hidden away. We only see what we can see. And while seeing is believing for some, the eye can be tricked. Belief can bias the eye to see things that are not there and not see things that are clearly visible. In science... Things are often not seen, but observed. Observing is a skill that requires more than light and shadow. It requires a careful awareness of your biases, a knowledge of observer limitations, and the ability to look beyond the surface to see what is hidden beneath. Science is a method of finding hidden away things, of our understanding mechanisms and features of things that live in darkness and cannot be seen by the naked eye. This is where our understanding of germ theory, gravity, electromagnetism, general relativity, chemistry, atomic theory, archaeology, genetics, and evolution all come from. This is how medicines are discovered, how technology works, how our history is known, and how we are now exploring the universe. All of it possible only because we have done more than look. We have observed and we have listened to This Week in Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone else out there. Welcome to this episode of This Week in Science. We are back to talk about science as we do on this show called This Week in Science. What happened this week? Well, we're going to talk about it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. We're going to explore. We're going to have questions. We're going to dive into uncertainty. Uncertainty. Yes. Are you ready? Let's do it. So ready. So ready. Oh, good. All right, everybody. I have stories tonight about hot magma, venomous snakes, climate history. Oh, uh, Bronze Age cheese, uh, uh, virtual fish maze, slap fights, and the man cycle. Justin, what did you bring? I've got inverted genes, 2,000-year-old GPS, mile-high microbiota, and weird web finds. Worldwide weird web. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Internet or spider? I guess we'll have to wait to find out. Uh, James, actually. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) excellent. (laughs) Um, I brought tadpole poop cannibal ants and an energy company okay blair has started an energy company that's good no (laughs) No. (laughs) in atlanta no and she has plants yes yes All right. Well, we are looking forward to all of these stories. I can't wait to talk about all of them. I look forward to all of your thoughts out there as you are listening to watching the show. I want to hear what you think about these stories. Let us know. We are live on this show every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Yeah, the old school Justin TV, but it's not Justin TV. It's the Twitch now owned by the other AMA thing now. And anyway, um, you can find us those places. 
And that's where shows of the live recording are held for your viewing pleasure. But the podcast can be found all places that podcasts are found once this show that we're recording right now is edited and posted up in the podcast verse for your subscriptional happiness. <sighs> and if none of that works for you, head over to twist.org. You can find show story links and other information, and hopefully that'll help you all out. Okay. You ready to dive into the never, science, never, everyone? Never end, never end this show with just having listened to the show. If there's something that captured your interest, where will it, those links. You can read more all about it. Where will it take you? Where will we go this time? You ready to dive in? Let's do it. Yes. All right. So the stories this week I'm going to start off with uh, relate to it's climate week. Well, it's already a week of climate. It's always a week of climate. The climate is the climate. You know, what's the climate where you are? Well, there's a global climate. There's a local climate, 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 climate. Researchers just published a study in science of their work looking into what is called the uh what is this uh, era of life on earth? What is uh, an era called the Phanerozoic? It covers the last 539 million years. The last 66 million of which is known as the Cenozoic era, beginning with that wonderful time in which the dinosaurs died and then the birds and the mammals became the dominant life forms well except for bacteria and plants and other things like that but and insects anyway uh the dinosaurs they turned into the birds and then the mammals were like yay let's make humans and that was it that's science that's evolution um <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't like, oh, we all lived in the same apartment building in New York City for that whole time over the last 66 million years, or even that all of life lived in one little tiny place on planet Earth for 539 million years. No, there was all sorts of stuff happening all over the planet, and there were continents on the planet that moved around the planet during that half billion years. So... Speaking of climate, it changed a lot over the last half billion years. And we've done many, many reconstructions and simulations of our historical climate record based on ice cores, rock cores, bones, and the isotopes that come from things. So uh, going back far, 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 we use oxygen isotopes to get back up to like uh 539 million years ago. More recently, we use carbon and nitrogen isotopes, but there's different elements in the isotopes of those el elements that have been used throughout our scientific history to be able to more and more accurately pinpoint what things were like at certain periods of time. One of the things that we've been able to take a record of that they were able to look at was like, oh, temperature, let's do that. Let's see how temperature shifted over the last half billion years. And then they're like, oh, carbon dioxide. Let's look at how carbon dioxide shifted mm -hmm. over the last half a billion years. And we've done this before. But the interesting aspect of what is different about this work, they have taken a number of models and estimates and taken all these snapshots of history from around the globe over the that that represent the last half billion years and they've put it together into their new record that they call the fan da which is the fanerzoic uh distributed record i don't remember but it's like it's some kind of the da stands for the uh the the record type that they that they are calling what they've done the the modeling that they've done um and what they have seen over this 485 million history is that, yes, there's been lots of change, lots of ups and downs. We thought that there was a lot more cold going on, however, and there's looked at the proportions of different kind of temperature ranges. And they found that hmm, from transitional to warm, those represented the majority of the historical record on our planet in terms of temperature. 
They also found that this historical record, their new record, was able to deal with a lot of the uncertainty that had been prevalent previously in the models. And now they were able to test it against the more recent 66 million year old record of the Cenozoic, and which is very consistent, has a lot less variability with it. And there they were like, okay, we know that has a lot less variability. So let's test our new model and see if it lines up with the Cenozoic stuff. And it does. So they're thinking that their whole historical record is a lot more accurate than what has been previously. Are there any big surprises? No, not really. Basically, it was been, it's been a nice temperature range on the planet. Uh, the poles are probably responsible for a lot of temperature variations on how things are working. The tropical areas have gotten really, really hot historically, up to like 47 degrees Celsius, which is, or I think, uh, which is almost like 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The researchers uh, looking at all this data and then comparing carbon dioxide, they do say that they see a very, very specific correlation between increases in temperature, increases in carbon dioxide, decreases, same thing, except for a couple of time periods, which this the discrepancy has shown up over and over again in other measures. And okay, they don't have any uh, any reasons as to why those discrepancies occur in this study. They can't explain any of that. Um, but they have uh, some really fun data related to the, Earth, the Earth's surface temperature history, much more accurate than it's been previously. The big thing that researchers are, are saying is something we should be thinking about is the fact that uh, the forcing or the variability of uh, climate shifts and so uh, a doubling in carbon dioxide and how many degrees of warming that means. Currently with the IPCC, it is suggested that a doubling of carbon dioxide would lead to two to five degrees Celsius warming globally as an average, uh, whereas the variability they see in this study is about eight degrees Celsius, which is a lot more than all the models that we are currently looking at. Um, suggest. So what does this mean? Nothing new. Really, it's just, again, another piece of data, more accurate representation of the history of our planet. So we have a better understanding of where it's going to be going in the future, hopefully. Justin, what do you have? So this is, uh, I'm actually going to start this uh, story with a couple of quotes. Uh, one is from Rachel Shannon, Shannon, a postdoctoral scholar in hematology at Stanford University, who says, Bacteria are even cooler than I originally thought. And I'm a microbiologist, so I already thought they were pretty cool. The other quote is from Amy Bott, professor of genetics and medicine, also at Stanford, who stated, I remember seeing the data and I thought, no way, this can't be right, because it's too crazy to be true. We then spent the next several years trying to convince ourselves that we had made a mistake. But as far as we can tell, we have not. So what's cooler than cool about bacteria and data defying and causing researchers to check, check, double check, and triple check their data? Genetic inversions. This is when a, oh. there's a physical, a physical flip of a segment of DNA. So that a, a segment that's reading CGTA uh, suddenly is reading ATGC. Just so this happens. We've we've recognized that this occurs occasionally. Uh, if it happens in a human, it can actually be a genetic cause for disease. It's one of the causes of hemophilia, where the inversion prevents the mechanisms for blood clotting to be expressed. So it's kind of known that this can take place in, in prokaryotes. Also, uh, some bacteria may be even seen, but we, what researchers discovered here is that, back, uh, discovered in bacteria is that these genetic inversions can occur within a single gene and then express new proteins that changes the organism's identity in some way or how it functions. So 
It's a pretty interesting find as it expands the central dogma of biology that one gene can code for only one protein, and that's what its, what its job is. There are, of course, uh, already sort of some uh, exceptions to this dogma. Proteins that are produced by a gene undergo all sorts of splicing and uh, pre-editing so that they actually can form multiple proteins from a single gene. But until now, no one had seen an entirely new functional gene hidden in reverse. The team identified thousands of in inversions that exist in bacterial and other prokaryotic species. So not only a discovery of this single gene inversion that it can occur and be functional, but they, uh, but they actually may be relatively common. The team suspects that there are specific enzymes that mediate this flip as well as certain environmental cues that can drive the change. So this, this is something that may be triggered by the environment. We've talked about this to some extent, but this is almost like a, uh, a real-time epigenetic change. Where, ah, this protein is, is not the one I need anymore. Let's do a little switcheroo. And now we're expressing a different protein that maybe is useful. So uh, what the team's now going to do is they're going to start to, to zero in on the cause and effect of this flipping and hows and whys, the scenarios under which it takes place, specific enzymes that are responsible. If they can track down the enzy enzymatic flippers, they may actually be able to reverse certain heritable diseases. And this sounds like a built-in CRISPRing gene therapy kind of a thing. Like there's some genes that can already can already do this, that have a mirror function that we just weren't aware mm. of. Uh, so, this so, gives so, us so so we think that maybe there there are just already waiting to be discovered these mirror functions in genes. Yeah. That they're already that we just haven't seen it. We just haven't looked for it well enough. Yeah, because they didn't. I mean, we we had, we had, it had been noticed for some time that occasionally genes are expressed backwards, and it is just thought, ah, this one has this weird, weird error that took place somehow. Right, but an error, right? That it's just like right. it's backwards in the code, not that it's getting mm -hmm. actually translated, transcribed, right. and turns into something. And now they're like. Maybe this is, maybe this is strategy, genetic strategy. So, so hmm. not only make this like have, of course, some they have to go and search for these things. One of the things that they might be able to look at is like, okay, if we can, they can identify specific enzymes that mediate flips, then they can see where are those enzymes present, uh, where might they be able to be present, what genes in that region might be. Uh, interesting to look at to see if there's a flipped protein that could be doing something. But this also gives us another mechanism. I mean, this is big. This is like another mechanism for evolution and epigenetics is, is hidden in this puzzle uh, as well as all of the protein capabilities that may be already there present in our genetic code or, but just eh, bacteria is what they're looking at right now, but they've, yeah. uh, it's a it's a new it's like a whole new field that uh, is 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 possibly being unlocked by this by this discovery, which is why they, again they like they like didn't believe their own results. Like this is this is not in any of the 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 you know, you, you you find a thing and you're like oh let me go look for confirming literature, let me go see where this has been seen before. And when you get to a point where you're working on your research and you can't find any kind of a confirmation for the thing you're looking at, where this thing that you've, you've discovered hasn't been seen before after, you know, yeah. tens of millions of researchers and scientists have worked on problems for decades and decades and decades, you go, maybe it's wrong. <laughs> first, thing, first thing is like, maybe, maybe we've gotten something poofed. They spent years 
reading thinking that it was a goof. looking at this and testing it and have discovered like no what we're seeing is a new thing bacteria and maybe more than bacteria maybe more than Jeez. bacteria yeah and maybe it's a big aspect of evolution maybe it's a huge aspect of things switching up and maybe it's not just single nucleotide polymorphisms maybe mm. it's big old gene inversions maybe it's yeah gene repetitions and then inversions like there are so many ways that this could be uh it's fascinating and then and then so so downstream from a from a, a gene uh printing out a protein there's a a sort of a pre-cleaving splicing mm -hmm. and all these like little additors that can happen so even even a, a regular gene can have different variants and manifestations that do slightly different work in the body. But now if you've got another entire ingredient to start with that you can also splice and edit and uh, just it opens up the ability for this protein catalog of workers in, in, a, in a biological system to have, have more options. And what triggers those it's going to There's, be fascinating. Yeah, I think that's the great, you know, in what triggers it, what makes it happen, when it does happen, was it originally accidental, and then it just became a thing, and just like every time it's like, oops, happy accident, now that's normal, and that's the way it works. That, I mean, that seems like, you know, biology, it's nature's kludge, you know, it's just how it all ends up. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's fascinating stuff. Blair, do you want to take us on a journey? Oh, yeah, to Florida to uh, talk about the energy company there. Florida, nature's They're probably huge. fine, yeah. right? Floridian yeah. energy company, Duke Energy. They're they're probably up to just generally good stuff, right? Are One they hurricane bored? Yeah. Yeah, turns out actually, yes, um, but not on purpose. <laughs> So this is a study looking at vegetation management uh, that is beneficial to utility companies and turns out to also be beneficial to pollinating insects. It's the largest scale study of its kind, covering the greatest number of sites and species uh, ever ever done for something like this. This is from the Florida Museum of Natural History. They surveyed 18 what are called rights of way managed by Duke Energy. So basically what that means is a right of way is where they have like um, a power line or some sort of utility infrastructure and uh, they need to mow, use herbicides or prune in order to create an electrical right of way. And so the way that they do that, they need to make sure that there's no like fire potential for sparkage around the, the items um, that there's no opportunity for it to get, you know, a, a wire to get brushed up against or knocked down um, that there's no kind of reduction in the amount of power getting to those utility pieces. And so that is their, right of way. And so when they create those, it turns out that uh, a lot of Florida's insect pollinators actually thrive in these areas that have been trimmed back. Now, it turns out that's actually because uh, it's because they actually normally thrive in areas of early succession, which is what happens after a forest fire. So normally there's there's these larger growth areas, there's a lightning strike, there's a forest fire, and then after that, these smaller uh, plants that, that ha promote like pollinating insects, um, they flourish and then they get outgrown and then those smaller plants die and then they grow nice and big and then a couple of years later, there's another forest fire right so but because we're on the scene there are houses nearby there are developments nearby and the utilities nearby we don't want forest fires so the forest fires are suppressed and you know that's like the classic thing about when colonizers came to the united states what's now called the united states we stopped doing fires in our forests because we were like fires bad in forests obviously but yeah. A lot of the native populations here 
knew how to manage forest fires sustainably. And so because of that, it's kind of thrown a lot of the succession balance Mm -hmm. out of whack in uh, a lot of forests across the United States, North America in general, I would say. Um, And so now, of course, forestry organizations are doing a better job of controlled burns to try to get back in that space. But again, if you're right near a house or a housing project or a development or utilities, you can't do prescribed burns. You just can't. And so instead, poison, <laughs> poison mowing, yeah. or um, pruning, hand pruning can still promote these pollinator spaces. And so, um, yeah, there's all sorts of numbers involved about how to measure this, but the long and short of it is that what is good for these utility company spaces for the utilities, quote unquote, right of way in these forested areas, it is also good for pollinators. So a rare win-win with industrialization that I wanted to share. I think it's fascinating. I love the the way that it coincides or collides with our understanding of the succession, ecological ecological succession. The whole story uh, is, I don't know, I think it's really fascinating. It's really cool. Yeah. So there you yeah. go. Energy companies accidentally doing good for the environment. <laughs> <laughs> it. it has to be. <laughs> Caveat. It's, let's be clear. <laughs> Yeah. They weren't like, oh, good, the pollinators. <laughs> it's like, well, we, we got to do them. them. No. <laughs> no. But no, that's great. Not at all. Yay, pollinators. Yay, energy companies. And hopefully those energy lines of the future will be even more sustainable, losing well less energy. Yeah. yeah, well maintained. And maybe they will be transmitting energy produced from sustainable resources yay the crowd goes wild with hope (sighs) let's talk about not well i guess it's succession it's um the succession of cheese and the bacteria (laughs) that are related It's a this is a a cheesy segue from succession (laughs) into um, archaeology and genetics. Researchers just published in Cell 50, open access cell journal, their work on the um, looking at Bronze Age cheese. Researchers were able to get samples of what looked like fermented milk products, dairy products from about 3,500 years ago from a cemetery in Zhaohe, China. And the um, <laughs> this, uh, this data that they, uh, that they collected, they were able to compare the genomes of the milk from the milk to genomes of dairy products from modern goats And so they they were able to go, oh, there were goats back then, goats now, compare the milk and everything. Oh, look, now we're going to compare the bacteria that are involved in these fermented products. They determined that it wasn't just Bronze Age cheese, it was kefir, that the fermented product was most likely a kefir-like substance. So can I, this is my culturally illiterate, culturally illiterate, Uh, what's a kefir? It's drinkable yogurt. <laughs> it is. You can oh, have a drinkable, okay. you can have a kefir water. You can have a kefir dairy product. Kefir is usually fermented, not just with probiotic, what we call probiotic bacteria, now lactobacillus, but also yeast. Um, there is a, uh, a whole fermentation process that okay. goes on. Um, so these researchers looking at uh, Asia, the Central Asia, the steppes into the uh, Caucasus. Historically, people thought that kefirs and cheese-like substances came from the Caucasus. But apparently, no, no, no. According to their research, Bronze Age kefir cheese from 3,500 years ago uh, came from the uh, from more of a Xinjiang 
to inland East Asia, that it moved uh, with the Caucasus and more of a Central uh, Asian area being more of a, a pathway for the spread of kefir over more of the Indo-European continent, but that really kefir spread uh, coastally and that this kefir, they could actually construct ancient uh, phylo uh, phylogenies to be able to determine how modern kefir relates to ancient kefir and the really interesting aspect of it, it was pretty much very much it just was its own thing in Zhaohe, because Zhaohe was a place where they didn't talk to a lot of people and they had their own goats and they were like, we have our own kefir cheese and we're just going to be by ourselves. But then they shared their kefir cheese and their kefir cheese got shared with other people's kefir cheese. And then it was lots of spreadings of kefir cheese. Um, so modern kefir cheese is quite different from ancient Zhaohe ancestral kefir cheese, but uh, it suggests also a a spread of trade for and uh, and culture throughout the greater Asian continent, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Kefir cheese, thousands of years of kefir cheese. Is it the same? Now you kind of speak like individual line the lineage of keeper that we're eating today <laughs> it is not exactly the same no and the uh but the bacteria many bacteria are related there are um there are lots of things that suggest their relatedness to uh, modern kefirs um the locations of these lactobacillus species and um comparison to that ancestral Zhaohe kefir and uh, current kefir stuff. So, yeah. That's that's yeah. cool. It's It would have been nice if it was the same. Like, I mean, that same broth. It's related. Yeah, no, it's related, but it's not the same anymore. You can use the same seed on yogurt for, like, years and years and years, right? So, like... <laughs> it's not like that. It's not it's it's like not the like sourdough yogurt. mother dough from the Bronze Age <laughs> passed down. But that Joao He kefir cheese, it's, yeah. it's pretty much still the same. There you go. Old school kefir cheese. That's what it is. <laughs> you want to tell me about uh, the Nazgul? No, Nazca lines. Or, yes, what's happening in Peru? Well, sometime around 2,000 years ago, the Nazca and Paracas people living in southern Peru in the deserts got really into making art on a massive scale. They created animals and human-like figures and plants out of gravel and stone. Uh, these are called geoglyphs. So these are sometimes uh, raised mounds of earth that are used to make the lines and the outlines. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, stones of maybe specific uh, darkness or brightness of stones that are laid out. Some of these can stretch 90 meters long. You can see them in an airplane better than you can see on the ground. Right. And some, I think a majority of them are in the like uh, five to 10, uh, 15 meter. So something that would be much more easy to appreciate on the ground. So over the past hundred years or so, 430 of these epic scale artworks have been discovered. They are classified into the larger line type glyphs created by removing stones and gravel to reveal lighter colored earth beneath uh, and smaller relief type glyphs that are drawn using surface stones colored uh, both black and white or kind of raised, slightly raised earth. In the big line type, glyphs are easier to spot using photographs shot from the sky, whereas the relief type glyphs average, it says here, averaging about nine meters in size are harder to see because of erosion and more subtle contrast with the desert terrain. So 430 have been discovered in the past 100 years. Then over about six month period, artificial intelligence was given 
lots of aerial photographs of the area and identified 303 new glyphs. So almost doubling the extent of our knowledge of this ancient artwork uh, in just a six month period. Among the glyphs, about 80% depicted humanoid figures. It says here decapitated heads, but it, maybe they only wanted to make a, you know, a profile. They're making a it statement didn't... to the gods. Yeah, well, but it could also just be like, you know, it's a profile picture. It's not decapitated. Mm -hmm. I just, just took a picture of the head. That's all I was drawing. Uh, also, lots of domesticated animals, particularly llamas. Most of the relief type drawings were found within the viewing distance from foot trails. Researchers think the art communicated daily life activities for viewing by small groups or individuals. <laughs> and in contrast, about 60% of the line type, long, big glyphs, depict wild animals such as birds, monkeys, and felines. The team suggests that these were linked with ceremonial pathways and pilgrimage routes. So I think the more practical, uh, the more practically think about how these might have been useful for people who were nomading about the desert 2000 years ago. So what you want to do is you want to follow the northern bird wing until you see a pack of llamas. Take the third hard right from the or take a hard right from the third llama there. And what you'll do, is you'll come to a giant monkey. See? You get to that giant monkey, and the path that leads directly off the monkey's tail, that's the one you're looking for. Follow that one, just past the big cats, and there, and there, if you you should be right where you're wanting to be. But if you come to a coiled snake, oh, turn back, you've gone too far. Like these can actually these could actually be location be landmarks. It, location landmark, I, I think that's one way, but I like the idea that it could be, I mean, we have movies now, right, that take mm -hmm. three and a half hours, right? These long, we've had long stories that we listen to over mm -hmm. fires, but during the day, maybe you could go on a walk with a storyteller, or, you know, your, your wise person, your shaman, and they take you on a journey and you see, you see these cre you know, creations from a distance and they tell the story as you move through an area and maybe it was an active, uh, an active uh, co-created storytelling or history telling. That's, I uh, love that idea. Yeah, like yeah. a walk through movie. Yeah. Right, yeah. This was a giant picture book, maybe. I mean, I it's kind of, these are excellent. They're beautiful. It's kind of like also there's like great. gallery art, which is usually different than art that you would buy and put into a home because it's usually of a scale that's massive, right? It can take up an entire wall. Not always, but uh, but it can take it. The gallery art can be quite big, sometimes bigger than anyone would actually think. These are like eh, 90 meter long uh, works of art. Like that's so wild. I think they're fantastic. I love the they're giant. They're incredible. I love that AI was able to do the pattern finding to be able to discover these things and make them more apparent to us. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, the, hopefully this is a perfect use them. of AI. Yeah, I love this yeah. use of AI. This is this is exactly what it's for, right? This Blair is approves. Kind of just can't. Yeah. Blair <laughs> Also, one of the things I find fascinating about these, you know, for some of the smaller ones, I, it's not as, as impressive, but for, for some of the larger ones, it is really impressive how uh, doing a very large scale work of art, you're not just drawing it by hand where you've got this uh, perspective that you can sort of see that, oh, I drew it this side, it was this big, and so I'll do it the same on that. You've really got to like be paying attention over 90 meters of how far you've gone and taking sort of measurements to make sure that you haven't gone too far so you don't have one leg that's longer than the other leg or what have you. This, uh, these took a lot of work. And, and if you, yeah, there's the map. Right? Look at this map. Look at how, how dispersed uh, these things are. Like they use this desert as their canvas. 
I think that's incredible. And maybe they told the story as they went, right? And maybe, and I, they, they, maybe there's something to the groupings and where they're located. And like you said, the distance that they are optimally viewed from. Uh, yeah. And a lot of these, like they were uh, saying, these are a lot of these are on or along uh, pathways that were used, uh, sort of ancient roads through the desert. So, so yeah, you're exactly right. If you were if you were going along this journey, you would have this sort of unfolding series of pictures that could could form a story, so that you were telling a story of 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 where you went. And though they are hard to see now, once upon a time they were probably much more visible and uh, you know readily readily witnessed by people passing through. Yeah. So cool. Very cool. It reminds me of how I saw a meme recently about how whenever there's uh, giant feats of art or innovation, we always want to credit it to aliens if it's in non-white spaces and then to like mm-hmm. just general in human ingenuity if it's in white spaces. <laughs> it's like the, the joke, right? And yeah. I think about how um this is definitely one of those things that however many decades ago somebody would have gone like oh crop circles they were drawn by aliens right absolutely no people it's people 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 yeah that's a cool one humans leading domestic animals with rope and decapitation scenes like just sure. I'm not I'm not convinced as I'm seeing a decapitation, but maybe I'm just maybe I think I, I'm seeing a decapitation. It it fits with their uh, the sports that they played that were very violent. <laughs> involved well, a lot and, of yeah, I think that's probably the context we're not getting, right? Like these various implements that they have in their hands mm. might yeah. lead to the expectation that that is a decapitation. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Cool stuff. Thanks, AI. Blair's happy with your use. That's good. Um, speaking of the land and you know what's on it and in it, uh, hopefully we can preserve these areas of ancient human artistic creativity. You know, the work that people did. Hope we can preserve it and uh, keep modern humans from destroying it. Recently, there were some uh, Nazca uh, Nazca works that were destroyed by people hot rotting in the desert. Uh, so that's not good, people. Your tires are going to mess that stuff up. You got to be careful of the world. Um, but volcanoes do a lot of that damage. You know, they, they, volcanoes go and the lava goes everywhere. And they would cover that kind of stuff up if there were a volcano with the ability to cover it up, cover up the land with lava anywhere nearby. Um, but what about that lava? Where does it come from? Well, researchers forever have been like, oh, hot spots, magma hot spots underneath the volcanoes. Duh. And each of those hot spots is like unique and is going to be like, look, I make this kind of stuff and I make this. And so there are unique signatures for these hot spots that are indicative of the, of the region, of the pressures of what's happening in the crust as that hot magma is coming up to the surface and getting pushed out by those magmatic hot spots from the mantle and onto the surface where it then becomes obsidian and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, lava. Researchers just published an open access study in Nature Geoscience suggesting, uh, based on their work, looking at a number of hypotheses about where does where does this stuff come from? Uh, where does the magma come from? Are they unique hotspots? Are they different hotspots? What's going on there? Well, they tested a whole bunch of things and they were like, nope. There is one common magma pit under the crust. There's lots like a magma soup that the magma comes and gets mixed in. And then as it gets pushed up to the hot spot, then it starts to go up and cool. And it is the specific conditions that are present during the cooling process as it gets pushed up to the surface that make 
the magma to the lava unique. So from the bottom, and then it comes out and, goes, and it goes out on the surface and then it gets recycled back underneath into the mantle again. And it goes into a different spot and it's like, I'm unique, I'm unique. And then the magma goes, ah, oh, no, I am the mantle and you are one. So there is a, a grouping where the magma gets moved around and mixed and everything's in this super hot magma soup, according to this study, um, and that it's the local conditions where the magma is being pushed out that give it its unique flavors. But yes, they call it, what do they, what do they call it here? They call it, uh, the in, within the mantle, they, uh, they call it the common magma. So there's no chemical heterogeneity below the hot spots. There is a common magma entity. Dun, dun, dun. Kind of weird. I mean, this is one of the weird things mm -hmm. about being on this rocky planet. It just seems so solid to know that we're just floating on melted rock. It's just such You're a like weird. a giant hot Isn't lava there? cake. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a solid cake. Hello. Dip that spoon in. Delicious hot chocolate comes out. <laughs> All oh, that hot chocolate comes so out. So intense underground. It's very intense underground, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, common primordial earth in the mantle still that has been just sitting there and it's waiting to get pushed out into those hot spots where it will become unique and less primordial in the process and has been over time, more modern into time and space of flux, magmatic flux. You know what else has fluxed over time and space? Snakes. How so? <laughs> <laughs> well, snakes came from somewhere. Yes. A lot of people think that venomous snakes like the Japanese spitting cobra and the family, the super family, Elapoidae, 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 Elapoidae. Anyway, that this super family of venomous snakes uh, originated in Africa. Well, I am here to tell you, according to a Kansas, a University of Kansas study published in Royal Society of Open Science, that, oh, Oh, no, no, no. Those venomous snakes, you want to know where they where they decided to originate from? Where? Florida. Is it Florida? I'm no, guessing it's Florida. Not Australia. It's not Australia and it's not Florida. No. No. I'm out of guesses. No. You're out of guesses. What about Asia? Mm hmm Yes. What about? What about Asia? I mean, Asia's connected to Africa. It is. It's not really, but kind of. <laughs> and over time, well, over time, maybe it was connected. And they and once were. Yeah, exactly. And they, it, yeah. There was more supercontinenty stuff going on, and mm -hmm. it's very possible. The researchers for this study did an analysis of various uh, snake species that are spitting and venomous and just the ones that we are afraid of, we don't like them, and they did not come from Africa. That's not what. That's not where they came from. Snakes, rich, yeah, snakes. Okay, came from a lot. Basically, everything came from that Gondwana land, supercontinent. I don't know, long time ago. Um, but snakes and the venomous ones, they came from Asia. That's what they've determined. Oh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Cobras. <clears throat> spitting snakes and from southeast asia yes but uh very much so just asia generally so that's um, a big general according to britannica <laughs> just to cite my source here um so snakes in general the oldest known snake fossil is in england at about 167 Ooh. million years ago. That's right. Scotland, right? <laughs> Southern <laughs> England, it says. Yeah. Oh, okay. Eophis under, underwoody. 
I love trying to pronounce um, these uh, these species names. Yeah, but yes, about 170 million years ago. Which what did the Earth look like then? What what did 150 million years separated? Ago? Yeah, very separated. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, because snakes. Because that's this is why I looked it up. Because snakes are pretty recent. Mm -hmm. The seropsid line of lizards and snakes as we know them today is like, in the grand scheme of things pretty pretty new so it's very strange that snakes are on every continent except for antarctica um yeah. but that snakes themselves the earliest fossil we have for that is after everything's kind of settled out for the most part so why 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 <laughs> and well, why are I mean, there venomous snakes but on every continent yeah well because because a couple of reasons one one it's just that you know what these these the oldest fossil doesn't mean the oldest thing right so they can no but, no, but we're pretty confident based on the the family tree of um of when snakes showed up based on the seropsid lineage. And then the other is uh, some, some kind of the storm thing happened, some kind of floaty thing happened because mm. the, 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 Oh, what do you call them? Uh, monkeys in South America. Old world. Are new related. world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the New World ones, and they have like but, but they're, they're pretty adaptation. different. Old World and New World monkeys are very different, and yeah, venomous but, uh, snakes but, are pretty different. But if you're talking from, about going yeah. time, their separation is not nearly as far back as the you know snake diversification, right? And yet, thanks, Napoleon. So is that for this true? study, that's it, pushed, right. it put this pushed the uh, not the origin of snakes generally but these right. venomous snakes back to about uh back 10 million years so uh what they're saying with this study is that um these elapoidae go back as far as 35 million years and the fossils mm -hmm. that they've uh discovered in the branchings and what they've seen um also including the sister lineage colubroidae uh, which is like pet snakes, like corn snakes and the non-venomous ones, um, that th that this taxonomic shift would pushed 35,000, 35 million years ago in Asia to Africa, 30 million years ago, Australia, 25 million years ago, and then into the Americas, 15 million years ago. So they would have started in the venomous snakes began in Asia, moved to Africa, down to Australia. And then, yes, they went across the Pacific Ocean <laughs> or probably the Pacific Ocean to uh, to the Americas. And that's and that's a, that, that's not too surprising because like, for some reason, this is also when uh, the, the monkeys are moving, I think. But yeah. but also there was a point when Australia was connected to South America. Mm -hmm. This is how we have the distribution of marsupials, which started in South America, moving into Australia uh, because they were connected through Antarctica at one point. So mm, I don't think that's right, Justin. I do believe what that part? that's that. OK, so first of all, all of <laughs> old world <laughs> monkeys and new world monkeys split apart about 30 million years ago. So that timeline is way okay. different from the snake timeline we were talking about. Second of all, the thing I was going to say about venomous snakes is that there are different types of venomous snakes. So there are rear fang snakes and front fang snakes. Now, I think this is about front fang snakes, but there's all these different convergent evolution styles of venom in snakes in different continents. So not all of them were a direct descendant from this one origin that this study is talking about. So I just want to clarify that as well. Um, the marsupial thing, Australia's marsupials essentially are an evolutionary dead end 
that other animals continued to evolve on the mainland. It is island biogeography. So it is not a direct descendant in this in South America from Australia. It, no, it's the other way around. It's no, South because America. the Australian marsupials do not have kneecaps. They are doing, they have all sorts of things. This is like a whole extra thing. We yeah. don't need to get no, into it. I, I, I don't, don't, say, I'm not don't have kneecaps either. Differently, but I'm pretty sure that we covered it on the, sh- uh, on the show that the, mars- the oldest marsupials in the record are in South America. And they're the progenitors, I think, I thought, or as I recall, of the Australian uh, uh Uh, marsupials at least in terms of this is how we can track it through thus far now if i am wrong about that then i am wrong about everything (laughs) (laughs) blair is fact checking me as we speak Uh. This is not fair. I'm getting fact checked, and you, there are other people aren't getting. You have the same internet what? I have, Justin. I don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. Well, we do know that over the last 65 million years, uh, Africa and South America were much closer together. They've been steadily moving apart over the last 65 million years. Yes, at one point in time, Antarctica was attached to Africa and uh, or close to. Um, and so it's been, things were a bit differently dispersed, and that may have made the movement of different species uh, different at different times. So, yeah. Anyway, <sighs> oh, the snakes! I knew that. I knew that South America and Antarctica were linked. I didn't know Africa was down. Oh, uh, be- maybe it was South America. Yes, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. I spoke. I misspoke. I really should not speak about old maps that I haven't studied enough. <sighs> Uh, I can show you if pictures. We if we didn't speak about things unless we studied extensively about them every time. We're looking it up, everybody. <laughs> what do you do? I look things up. Yes. I like to look things up. Yes. So there is an image that I've got right now that I'm going to share. Uh, it's got an image of, uh, of we have the different eras. So we get into Jurassic, we have South, uh, probably got the Antarctic and South America. And, and that's Australia, mm-hmm. so I lumped into the side Australia, of it. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Over the years, Australia blooped off from Antarctica. Um, Africa mushed into, it was part of, and then came away from, and then mushed back into uh, Indo, uh, the the Asian continent. Um, yeah, things mushed, things spread, and and now they are where they are. But I think the big uh, the big story is that Africa and South America were closer together, and also Australia was smushed in there more closely as well um, over that period of time. Some pretty pretty neat images if you want to search up where different bodies of land were at different times throughout the history of the planet. I like doing that. Oh, we're going to look at this fun thing. Here we go. Triassic, Cretaceous, present day. The Cretaceous, 65 million years ago. We've got some good mushing and smushing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Anywho, snakes don't have knees. Hmm. They They haven't had a need for knees for quite some time. I need knees. And you know what? I'm going to need in a few minutes. I'm going to need Blair's Animal Corner to set me straight about some of these animal things that we're discussing. (sighs) But right now, I want to say thank you so much for joining This Week in Science for this episode. We do love that you are with us for another conversation about the recent scientific discoveries of the week, what we thought was interesting, and also the questions that we have. And I hope that you have interesting questions as well. If you have information, let us know what you know so that we can update our understanding. Additionally, if you like the show, please head over to twist.org and click on the Zillow link, not Zillow. No, I'm not selling houses. Oh my goodness. Click on the Zazzle link if you would like to have a bit of our merchandise. Support Twist through getting a shirt, a hat, 
a mouse pad, a notepad, a mug, maybe a beach towel for your Australian beach getaway. I don't know, maybe you're going to Antarctica, Antarctica for its Antarctic summer. Maybe you need, I don't know, a twist tote bag. We've got all those things and more. Lots of twists, swag that you can buy. It helps support the show. Go to twist.org, click on the Zazzle link, and you'll be able to find all sorts of things to wet your shopping whistle. Additionally, we also have our Patreon community. So if you want to support us in an ongoing fashion, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link, $10 and more a month, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show. Additionally, there's all sorts of additionalies. I guess the last thing is share the show. Please subscribe to us wherever you find us and share with people you care about because they need twists in their life as well. Right now, I'm going to come on back. It is time for Blair's Animal Corner on This Week in Science. Oh, my goodness. Let's get the music going. It's Blair's Animal Corner. Jokes are creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, She's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels and a What you got, Blair? I have tadpole poop. Or the lack thereof. Ooh. Um, it's better so to have a funny. lack of tadpole poop than too much? I don't know. Depends. In this case, yes. Uh, this is a study on Ifinger's tree frog in Japan. Some frogs, uh, their tadpoles are in ponds or lakes or streams. Some tadpoles, they hang out in the collected rainwater in a bamboo stump. And that is the case for these tree frogs. They hang out in these very small, very confined, collected water reservoirs in leaves or trees or bamboo and so they are really confined and constrained into these very particular habitats for the entire time that they are in tadpole form before they can go up on land and live their true amphibious life um, and so Nagoya University researchers were curious about how they achieved this when there was no way for them to kind of dilute or cycle through waste in these confined spaces for months. If they were just pooping in this water, ammonia would le reach a toxic level very quickly and these tadpoles could not survive. So what were their adaptations that were allowing them to grow up big and strong and turn into full frogs in these confined little water kind of droplety spaces <laughs> what were they yes and so um the the first one is that they just didn't poop so instead of releasing waste <laughs> into their environment they would just store poop in their intestines for months wait excuse me i mean yeah. People do that sometimes, but yeah, it's not that's for a month. That's a without problem. And they go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, but no, to, I mean, tadpoles, they're we, they're not eating very much. Um, they're also using a lot of energy to grow, you know, arms and legs. So, <laughs> um, so the, the waste they products probably don't are have a lot of waste. waste. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot to eat in there either. So all of that to say, um, they're storing all their poop in their body, in their intestines. And also that means that a lot of the ammonia from their, their fecal matter is being reabsorbed into their body, which to another frog would be toxic. So this is the other piece is that some ammonia is being released into the water and the ammonia they're maintaining in their intestines is also being released back into their body. And so they are also able to take an amount of ammonia in their body that is higher than other tadpoles could. So they can take what it, to another frog would be a toxic level of ammonia. However, there are limitations to that. So 
the first thing they did is they they exposed a bunch of tadpoles to different levels of ammonia, found that generally these tree frogs could take more than the average frog, but there were limits. And then the other piece was that they they tracked their pooping and they figured out where they were storing their poop. And so all of these things mean that they have both of these adaptations to help them survive in this extremely extreme environment. Um, the I will also mention there are some invertebrates that do this. Um, not exactly, but similar. Um, there are... Uh, some bees and things like that, that um, their larva will actually um, store poop in their body. Um, bees and ants, they retain feces in their intestines and that's to keep their nests clean just so they're not harboring like bacteria or anything like that. But those are invertebrates. It's very different. Uh, this is a complicated gut in a vertebrate animal and they they've found a way around a, a very obvious issue related to growing up in a little bamboo shoot puddle. This is so fascinating. I mean, we use uh, ammonia, right. For our uh, fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Ammonia helps to grow our plants so we can take the poop from things and uh, turn it into fertilizer and help grow stuff. But if we've, got ammonia in our system, that's bad for our growth. And it's toxic because the ammonia ends up feeding back into our, uh, into our cells and like, it, it kills you. So insect or not insect, you have to get rid of the waste, right? right. It's a, that has to happen. And it's fascinating that there are some insect species that hold on to it and can deal with those high ammonia concentrations in their tissues. And so there's definitely going to be adaptations metabolically to allow that to happen physiologically. And then that there are certain, there are differences in these frogs as well. And it's important for this particular species to help with its survival uh, again, in competition with other species in the, you know, in that, in that niche, wherever it's, wherever it is, it's so interesting. This it must be such a relief to <laughs> finally, like, we're past the stage, we can now get rid of all of what we've been, that must just be. Oh, to finally be able to poop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, actually, I, I will say, um, I'm going to evoke, uh, Brian in this, uh, my husband because i was reading him this story earlier and he was like oh i wonder if having higher ammonia concentrations in their body also uh makes it harder to eat them which is a great question you so, don't want to eat these frog legs yeah that they're that they could be toxic <laughs> to eat because they have high ammonia amounts like i think that's really really good question um <laughs> That's and really that's, definitely you know, predators, worth looking right? into. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately, why are they being laid in these very particular spaces to avoid predators? So um that could be a very cool double whammy that would allow them to make it through to adulthood. And keep in mind now the the these two kind of vastly different animals that I've mentioned, the bees and ants, and then these frogs, um, the fact that they are very different in many ways but they both do this specifically in the you know larval or the young stage of a metamorphosis is very interesting too that they have that in common that they're specifically holding on to their waste during the metamorphosis in in like the the, the middle of the metamorphosis kind of process as there's something there why? Why is that? Like, would it be harder to do this as an adult and easier? Probably. Yeah. yeah before their body most plans vulnerable. sorted out, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Are they, are they, is this metamorphosis period when they're most vulnerable because they're not as good at swimming and they're not as good at jumping and getting away, right? So they're, they're limited behaviorally, not the best of both worlds. 
And I think Brian needs to publish. I think that's uh, <laughs> it's a great yes, observation. Do it. Yeah, Brian, forget nursing school. Do this instead. Yeah. Study ammonia toxicity in tadpoles in Japan. <laughs> I um, mean, that's that, that's a niche for uh, for academia. That's great. Yeah. That's that's, that's graduate school right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's a whole Perfect. career. <laughs> um, so from one type of waste to another. Ant queens cannibalize their sick offspring and recycle them. Oh, gosh. Okay. Recycle. Yep. Are you ready? <laughs> Strap in. So, um, what? Ants, ant queens, uh, they will found new colonies all on their own. And in those early stages, they're very vulnerable to their entire brood being wiped out by disease. And they're likelihood of success as a colony is extremely tied to how many workers they can create how quickly if they can grow quickly and they have a bunch of workers then they can establish a colony and survive and their genetic lineage will survive so researchers at oxford's department of biology looked at specifically um a fungal pathogen that is really good at wiping out ant colonies and so they wanted to see what would happen when ants get this pathogen. And if there was a, a clear path to success to avoid this pathogen from just ruining everything for these queens that are trying to found new colonies. Um, so what they did is they infected a bunch of these black garden ants with this fungal pathogen when the queen was trying to establish. Queens cannibalized 92% of the infected larva, leaving no remains at all. None. Only 6% of control larva that had not been infected were eaten. Very small number. When it comes to cannibalizing your babies, maybe anything above zero is a lot, but in, in the insect world, it's pretty good, 6%. Anyway, <laughs> so um, when they found a sick larva in the brood, they would immediately start eating them. They would spend hours chewing them up until every last bit is consumed. Because remember, this is a fungal pathogen. So if they don't get rid of all of it, the fungus could spread. Where this gets interesting is that they had about 24 hours to get rid of that fungal pathogen. If the 24 hours had elapsed and... Then they went and tried to eat the fungal infected ants. About 80% of those queens would die. So if, if they did it too late, they also would spray infectious larvae with their antimicrobial venom. If it was spreading too fast or if they hadn't eaten them in time. Still, about 80% of the time they died. So they, they did it within the first 24 hours when they were infected, but not yet contagious. The, the queens did not get sick. Part of the reason they think the queens didn't get sick is that um, they have a uh, antimicrobial venom gland, which I mentioned a second ago. They kind of sprayed that over the infected guys if it had been over 24 hours. But it looked like the females were massaging it while they were eating, when they were eating the guys within 24 hours. So they think that actually the queens might be swallowing some of the acidic antimicrobial venom to kill the fungus inside their bodies, which is crazy. That's oh, like fascinating or something. Yeah. yeah. Wild. Um, and the reason they talk about recycling in this um, is that there was a 55% higher egg laying rate following cannibalization. So once they ate all these fungus ridden larvae, bam, they created way more eggs. So they basically were able to replace the eggs they lost with the energy that they took. So um, when they start these colonies originally, they essentially starve themselves 
to raise that first generation. Because remember I said like this colony is make or break in, in the very beginning. And um, so they basically just reproduce themselves almost to death. They almost starve themselves to just using all of their body's nutrients to make as many babies as possible. So if you're going to lose a bunch of them, you're regaining the, that energy starting over. So that's the recycling piece. So really good, um, what they're calling hygienic cannibalism. <laughs> hygienic yes yeah well the, the they weren't going to be successful young ants anyway they, they it's good for the the colony mm -hmm. um and so this has only been observed in queens but never among mature worker ants they think this might be because unlike queens who seal themselves into the nest worker ants can dispose of infected larvae by carrying them out so Worker ants just kick them out of the nest completely. But the queen is like, give me those sweet nutrients back. <laughs> sweet, sweet nutrients. We're not just oh, the insect the world is a, is a brutally inefficient model for you gotta be. Um it's so it's this is another situation where it makes us feel uncomfortable because cannibalism, we're associating it with things when we relate to humans that is very icky and ah. Um, but just like when I used to work at the zoo and we would feed hard boiled eggs to the chickens, people would freak out. It's like, no, actually, uh, it's good chickens for them. often they do it. eat their eggs that are unfertilized because they want to regain the nutrients that they lost. It's pretty normal. So it's, um, reproduction is extremely costly. And so, yeah. I mean, anybody who has grown a fetus who might be listening can attest to that. So um, if, if there's a way that you can regain some of that energy that you lost, that is, that is an important thing to be able to do in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Any way that you can. And we know that like spiders, they'll often eat their mate. We can't do that. Uh, we, we don't want our, we don't want patricide. We, we don't want, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, the success is optimized, right? That's the, or at least in the animal kingdom, evolution favors optimization of success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well put. Yeah. In terms of ourselves and our, you know, our emotional, psycho psychological responses to these kinds of na nature stories, right? The, the trauma, the, the drama of, um, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> um, thinking not just about the the cannibalism aspect, but from a perspective of public health, we don't just kick sick people out of society, right? right? right. We yeah. used to have well, leper colonies. Well, well. But, and we used to have sanitariums where we, you know, we still do actually, you know, but but more often quarantine. now quarantine is still a quarantine. thing. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting to kind of think about how we do this, but at, but, but at the same time, we're not like, okay, we are, you know, are, are, I'm not going to talk about insurance and talk about, you know, public health systems and what, how they're set up, but societally we are more and more working toward being able to allow everybody to get the most out of life. Um, it is not the way it is, you know, it's not, that's not absolutely the way it is, but I think that those optimists among us believe that we can get there and that one day people will not just die because they don't, they can't pay their bills or get their, um, insulin shots or whatever it happens to be. So the thing we, I'm finding we interesting protect about this everyone. Yeah. Is, is this is a, this is a strategy that there is a countermeasure, biological countermeasure for with this gland. This is a situation where there is uh, at least an instinctual uh, recognition of the problem and the solution. This is this is a this is a when I 
I will call a genetic memory, an inherited memory. This is a knowledge that these ant queens seem to have about the, their environment and the world around them. That is not learned uh, through our what we would consider external. Here's some information and I will now pass it on to you because you had no idea. This is, this is what is so fascinating. Is, is where is this? Where is this knowledge? How is this knowledge captured mm-hmm. throughout the lineage of the, 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 these ants, ant queens? That's passed down specifically to the ant queens because they, again, different behavioral than you said, the workers. Like, so whatever that is, is not inherited there and is not a, their genetic instinct. Like the whole concept of instinct itself to me is very fascinating. But So I would, yeah. I would wager that if we did a oh, wider yeah. study with these ants where you just tested different types of of infection not just the fungal infection that there would be a higher rate of cannibalization on any infected larva that would be my wager yeah. i don't know that for sure but that would be my guess yep. is that the the hardwired instinct that you're talking about justin is basically to cannibalize unhealthy larva that would be the wager that i would make but we don't know we don't have that research right but I think that would be a very easy thing to select for ants that eat unhealthy larva and breed new larva. But these Pass are on these more are... genetic code. Their colony is more successful. That trait yeah. continues. Yeah, no, it would be really fascinating to see because it is to see if there's a difference with the, the type of affliction. Mm-hmm. Right. Are these ones unhealthy because they lack nutrients? They were placed in them wrong part of the brood and they didn't get enough access to some something of this nature or or is this specifically a fungal strategy which you know right. is going to spread quickly and well, affect and everything versus... remember that ants are chemical communicators too mm-hmm. so that means that there is That's some sort of chemical say. signal yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> there's some sort of chemical signal that yeah. she is receiving from these larvae yeah. that they are infected with Yes, she, she's not at infected, all blind to this. Or the that way they're that they infected with a fungus, yes. right? Yes. Yes. But then, but then, is there, are there, based on which type of chemical signal, are there different cannibalistic strategies? Like, this mm-hmm. becomes very, yep. very intensely fascinating very quickly. And apparently there are many strategies. And uh, looking at different studies, doing a Google search just right now. I don't know this. I haven't haven't known this before this moment, Um, but many ants will eat the eggs, larva, the young, and um, but uh, necrophagy of the adults is much more rare. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's... It's one of those uncomfortable truths that people really don't like to hear about the animal kingdom. There's a lot more cannibalism going on than you might be comfortable with. Happens a lot. (laughs) Um, It says uh, a study from 2020 suggests that the frequency of cannibalistic necrophagy of nest mates increases during starvation. Hmm, Who Mm -hmm. knew? Uh, Mm -hmm. Some ants have the behavior where it's fairly common and others do not. So it depends on different species as well. And they, from 2020, they say it might be part of the hygienic behavior repertoire. And like you said, Mm -hmm. Blair, chemical detection of infections um, to handle the pathogens before they're able to spread throughout throughout a colony or a nest is important but yeah starvation is another reason yeah i will say i unfortunately am aware that if you uh, have too many mice in a particular area and they don't have enough food and they have babies they will eat them cannibalism happens a lot in the animal kingdom yeah it happens a lot sorry cannibal earth you're just a protein source oh um blair have you done all your animal stories all of it i'm ending on that isn't that fun sorry everybody (laughs) i think justin you might help us digest it a little bit. We're going <laughs> to move on to your stories. Yeah. So uh, this one is about the gut microbiota. Uh, and we have talked about it on the show. It has a role in just about everything. Digestion, uh, 
health and cognition. Basically, to recap, your gut microbes, bacteria inside of you, help with digestion, mood, mental health, physiological development, psychological development, immune responses later and throughout your life, sleep patterns, food cravings, partner interest. And they do a lot. So they do a lot more than just live in you. They are you. They're a big part of who you are. One group of bacterial passengers is emerging is particularly beneficial. It's a genius of gut bacteria known as Blautia. Previous research has suggested Blaudia can benefit cognitive development in infants and lower adults' risk of obesity and diabetes. Now, researchers are glimpsing another potential benefit of these microbes, helping people adapt to high altitudes. Uh, this is researchers from China recruited 45 men to move for 108 days from their homes at around 250 meters above sea level to a town at about 3,700 meters. At high altitude, the men ate similar food at the same time as they had at home, minimizing the effect of changes in diet and lifestyle in the gut micro microbes. Seven times over the course of the study, the team collected fecal samples and, from the men and analyzed the DNA it contained within to monitor how their gut microbiomes were changing. After just two days at high altitude, the men's samples contained fewer kinds of microbes. They quickly became less diverse. But a handful, several of the 20 known Blaudia species, went from being very rare to very abundant. Mm. The same subset, including a species of B. Wexley Ray, was also especially common in residents of the plateau who lived at more than 4,000 meters for at least five months, some uh, as much as uh, five years. Uh, so, yeah, the, what's going on here? So, following up on these clues, the team had uh, subjected mice to low oxygen conditions, something equivalent to if they were living at super high altitudes, but they didn't put the lab there because the researchers were like, I'm not doing that. Uh, so, they gave them uh, this Bautia sort of a probiotic to half of them every other day. And so hypoxia can trigger immune cells to release inflammatory factors that can cause fluids to build up in lungs, brain, and intestine. This buildup can lead to sickness, headache, nausea, fatigue, sleep disturbances, and these things can come on pretty quickly. This is, this is common to people who are uh, being tourists in Tibet, or going up to very high, you know, high uh, anywhere in the world, very high altitudes. Yep. But the Bautia treated mice showed much less of these ill effects, according to the team. Yeah, there was also, this also might, they think, explain how Bautia might protect against diabetes and obesity. There were studies involving uh, uh, 400 people in Japan where the researchers there had uh, found that the more Bautia a person had in their gut, the less likely they were to have either of these conditions. How do we get it? Can we <laughs> can we have Bautia yogurt? Well, hang on Bautia now. Bautia kefir before I go. If I'm going to Tibet, can I can I preload <laughs> on some, so, on some so actually, high altitude that's, that's one... altitude probiotics? Yeah. That's one of the things that they're talking about. They want to, uh, you know, product this into a mm -hmm. thing that you give people traveling to high altitudes. Yeah. Um, but this That's also, this is, great. and it, there's still so much to, to be learned. Uh, it's very ill understood still at this point what the body of species overall effects are. It's not been that well studied. But, but there is... There is also the. Uh, this is a quote from v uh, Vanya Klepak Steraj, a microbial ecologist at Wesley College. It's a super. Its superpower comes from mediation of the gut brain axis. Some of the fatty acids it makes, for example, are known to activate receptors in the vagus nerve, which controls mm. and connects to the digestive system, heart, and brain. 
Because yeah. one of the th- other things they've noticed, uh, this researcher, uh, which was last year in science advances, that there, when when it was in infants, they had uh, more babbling. There was more. They, they were had t- more, more to talk talkative. about. Yeah, yeah. They were they were literally uh, talking. Huh. And that talking could also be because this is uh, something that was being talked about in the brain. It's so crazy. Yeah. Or no, sorry. This is a, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another recent, this is a recent, a different recent study. And people suggested it can curb development of appendicitis, an immune driven condition there as well. So there's like all these strange potentials. Yeah. Infants but are more seen- able, apt to babble and laugh when they have more. Uh, Bautia in their guts. So, but you mentioned the metabolic products as well. So we've got, um, you know, what are they, what's being produced? There's some figures here that suggest, suggest butyrate, pyruvate, that there are compounds that are produced that might influence the vagus nerve. So even if we can't get the bacteria, can we influence the pathways of the production for these metabolites? Or can we influence just, just, supplement with uh with some of these products yeah i'm gonna take so, my butyrate supplement for you know <laughs> so the thing with bladia is that the, it's a, we don't know really its connection to human health disease but yeah and it may not be the important bacteria at all right or at In least not operating solo. Seeing, yeah well it might not be solo like this is the one that they've identified but it could be that because it's, you know, bacteria create it's communities, a that it's, yeah. it's a population presence indicates that there's another one that's active. Like we don't have a specific like one-to-one uh, mechanistic thing here yet. So, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it a probiotic yet, but uh, I wouldn't be afraid of taking it. <laughs> just you don't want to you, you don't ever want to take something that could cause disease because you've already got enough or you know you anything we do in that regard we could be yeah. influencing the you're not just like you yeah. said influencing the one particular species you're influencing an ecosystem right the microbiome that's a biome but like, in the in the world of nutrients savannah. supplements probiotics and all this sort of thing like Everything that we know is is like really limited. Anyway, like the, what what the effect of taking any of these things actually has to a degree, aside from you know, having, yes, a, a good diet with uh, certain categories there, you know, that are positive generally. Specifically, adding a one thing or taking away one thing, we we don't really have a high definition understanding. Yeah, yeah you don't all. want to accidentally release cane toads into Australia, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You just you <laughs> might have toads, all the good toads. intentions, yeah. but you're going to spend a lot of time then dealing with the consequences. Okay, now mm-hmm. weird discovery okay. on the web. Uh, this is uh, the JWIST, James Webb uh, Telescope, has discovered weird galaxies that have gas that seems to be outshining its stars. This is from a hey. Royal Astro- Astronomical Society press release. The discovery of a weird and unprecedented galaxy in the early universe could help us understand how the cosmic story began. This galaxy, if you're tracking, GS NDG 9422, seen at approximately 1 billion years after the Big Bang. So actually very super young, super young. It stood out to, to the astronomers because it, it's this sort of odd, never before seen light signature that is indicating that, yeah, its gas seems to be shining more than the stars. The totally new phenomena is significant, researchers say, because it could be the missing link phase of galactic evolution between 
uh, gas and energy being in an area and formation of the first stars and the first sort of then larger formation of galaxy of stars. That, uh, this is the quote. My first thought in looking at the galaxy spectrum was, that's weird, which is exactly <laughs> what the Webb telescope was designed to reveal. Totally new phenomena in the early universe that will help us understand how the cosmic story began. That was Dr. Alex Cameron, Oxford University, lead researcher on the project. Hmm. That's weird. So, it's weird, but this is like also this is like a beautiful thing about web. It's it's it is it is peering into uh, far far back into the cosmic history, and it's also like there's going to be there's going to be a lot of James Webb originating stories coming out. There's the whole Hubble tension uh, thing about uh, the expansion of the universe and what's going on there. And, it's finding uh, more of a consistent signature of some of this expansion than other looks. But then it's also like looking further back and seeing formations early into the universe that we wouldn't have expected to have been formed at these points. The, the knowledge of the cosmos that this one telescope is giving us is replacing knowledge that we have had for decades if not hundreds of years uh, about some of the and it's the... exactly what it was designed to do which is so yeah. cool yeah. <laughs> like it's doing what it's supposed to it's seeing exactly the stuff that we couldn't see previously not just the uh you know the resolution of seeing so far back but being able to see through the dust and the gas and being able to get through the hot stuff to be able to see the cold light and be able to just see the the energetic signatures of the radio signals that are the electromagnetic spectrum that are out there the infrared spectrum as well like it's yeah yeah this is they exactly they, what it's supposed to do it's so cool and i think the the reason that the this the gas is outshining is because they think this is in the midst of a an intense amount of star formation mm -hmm. uh, in this galaxy and it has not captured the gas so the gas cloud is very dense and it's surrounding everything and so it's basically like it's basically getting lit up by all these uh, star formations i don't know if you've ever well i actually i would actually i would suspect I both stars. of you have witnessed this because both of you have lived in the san francisco area which is a can be a very foggy place mm -hmm. But on a on a even on a foggy night, if you're walking around streetlights or something else, it kind of glows. It kind of becomes luminescent uh, around around light sources, where you can actually, see, you know, I I, re, I recall once being uh, living not far from a car dealership that's got like an entire lot of like bright lights that for some reason stayed on all night. And every time there was a very foggy night, it lit up the entire street like it was daytime because it just became super luminescent within that within that fog. So sort of what it looks like is going on here. Right. That's exactly what's going on here. And that's that's the cool part of this is we're seeing it. Yeah. Lighting it all up. We'll see more. I think this is, you know, we just haven't looked at everything yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is one and it's like oh it's gonna reach change, change everything it's like well yeah as soon as we find a whole bunch of other ones just like it or in similar phases it's gonna it's going to do that absolutely oh web doing all the good stuff for our view on the universe it's so fantastic um i'm gonna take us away from uh looking at space i want you to imagine being a zebrafish and I want you to imagine Dad. being, <laughs> yes, you're a zebrafish in a laboratory. And the researchers want to put you in a maze. And the researchers, because you are a model species being used for genetic understanding of the evolution of, you know, the vertebrate brain and, uh, and 
abilities, behaviors. Well, yay, zebrafish, they're going to put you like in a tea maze maybe. Oh, but oh, they want to put electrodes in your head. That's going to make it hard for you as a little zebrafish to swim around and get have free reign of the water. Well, what if I'm swishing swim in front of an iPad? Is that what's next? <laughs> Pretty much something very, very much like that. Researchers just published in uh, Cell Reports Methods their new system to put fish into virtual reality. Mm -hmm. These researchers are taking uh, zebrafish and they've got them in a, a very interesting setup in which they uh, have the fish isolated and have them in a, a space where they can visualize the world around them. There's a digital screen in front of them onto which targets are placed and the fish is activated based on stimuli to behave in a particular way he wants to move right or left or move their heads but they are basically stuck like a, a rat or a mouse that's having um in a one of the head vices that holds the brain in place uh so they can have their neurons uh, measured. It's very exciting. So the fish isn't actually going anywhere, but it thinks it's going somewhere because it's in, a in VR. And so this research, hopefully, will be able to allow researchers moving forward to uh, optically and electrically uh, image neural mechanisms for the cognition of space in the model species of the zebrafish. And in addition, being able to do this um, in a way they can, zebrafish, they can modify genes, they can knock in, knock out, do chemicals in the water, they can do all sorts of things to study spatial navigation and cognition in VR, in fish. I think it's fascinating. And these fish, they're up for an amazing game. Uh, the setup, like I mentioned, um, they have a a device that it's like a, it's a little uh, the fish swim into it and they get stuck and they can't keep going. It's like they're cats, but they don't have whiskers. And so they swim into an opening and then they can't back out because their gills and their stuff gets in the way. Anyway, they are glued in with dental cement and <laughs> held in place. And they want to. They want to swim. They want to do all the things that they're that they're going to do. Uh, while the researchers are able to use infrared LEDs and cameras, optogenetics, optically imaging um, certain aspects of the brain. They can use electrodes to stimulate areas of the brain to stimulate different movements for the fish. Um, and then they're able to measure the trajectory of the fish because of the VR situation that they are placed in as they measure the force that's transduced in their device that the fish has swum into on any side. Fishy VR! We all want to do this. Woohoo! Except for the dental glue. I know. I don't want the dental glue. Don't put anything on my head with dental glue. Please, no. Justin, have you ever uh, wanted to talk about the menstrual cycle? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, well, to be fair, to be fair, I I didn't know there was. Such a thing. <laughs> there is such a thing. Um, we're not going to call it the menstrual cycle, but there is a uh, hormonal circadian rhythm that exists in the male brain and body. Whereas women undergo a 28 day long ish menstrual cycle. Men undergo a daily hormonal cycle. There is a shift in testosterone, estrogen uh, throughout the day, 
where testosterone is highest in the morning and decreases during the day. Um, there is high variability daily in it changes in women and in men. It's throughout the day on an hourly basis. Uh, which is fascinating. We've got lots of evidence that highlights this through the years. Researchers just published um, their work uh, looking at the brains of uh, one man. This is a very, very deep study looking at lots of evidence. Um, <laughs> they investigated the impact of circadian rhythms on global and regional brain morphology in one male, a densely sampled male. Every day for 30 days, one man came in and had uh, their brain uh, looked at with MRI and they took hormonal levels. They found that there were changes in the, uh, there were changes in the gray matter and the, so the cell bodies and the connections between neurons from morning until night. Okay, so in the study timeline, uh, the researchers had one guy who was uh, looked at for a month. They looked at behavioral assessments, aggression, vigor, uh, all sorts of things, and how those feelings changed during the day. They took steroid home hormone samples morning and evening, for 30 days as well. And they found that testosterone was very high in the mornings uh, and then de and uh, was very low in the evening. So testosterone is high in the morning, low in the evening. And then uh, moving forward, the estradiol was fairly constant, but also high in the morning and lower in the evenings. Cortisol was also very high in the mornings and really low in the evening. So this swing is that it, common thinking. You want to like have a cool, calm hangout with your male partner. Uh, well, cool and calm and collected in the evenings for that nice hangout. Dudes, get your stuff done in the mornings. That's the way it works. Anyway, so what happened with the brain? Well, cerebrospinal fluid changed during the day and also total brain volume changed in this individual over the 30 days. So uh, cerebrospinal fluid was lower in the mornings and higher in the evenings, but brain volume itself was higher in the mornings and lower in the evenings. They found that certain parts of the brain seemed to be more highly affected than others. So the occipital cortex, uh, more involved in vision, was much larger in the mornings and smaller in the evenings. And the striate cortex was, again, larger in the mornings and smaller in the evenings. So this was consistent anecdotal, throughout the brain. Yeah. Anecdotal evidence that supports this. How did you, how do you feel? Morning twists versus evening twists. <laughs> well, it is. You no, know, if you look at radio. When is the most testosterone driven aggro kind of over the top radio? Tradition? Morning talk shock jock morning radio. Morning talk radio. <laughs> yeah. Over the top. <laughs> <laughs> like it's insane. Yeah. But you don't have like that same kind of drive time radio on the way home. What you get instead is more calm voices. It is. Uh, recounting the day's news and telling you what's been going on in the world. Unless we're talking about like uh, NPR type radio. NPR type radio, though, has an older audience whose testosterone levels have probably already dropped. <laughs> but, but there's, but the, but yeah, like that morning, that morning talk radio has always been sort of classically, it's like monster car truck show radio programming type stuff. Yeah. In the mornings where people are just being ridiculous, there's extra loud noises, it's over the it's completely insane in the United States, that morning morning radio. And in LA, this is actually part of why I was kind of interested, uh, I got interested initially in doing radio and studying broadcasting, was, was from living in LA and being mm. in the car for so much of the day. And, and there are 
pallet of morning talk radio available for you. But everyone is sort of, that's a one place that everyone was tuned into because your car had a radio and there's just so many channels and you're stuck there back in those days. Yeah. And that was all you had. But, but the yeah. question here, yeah, but the question here though is, you know, why does the brain size sh change? And we're looking at one male, but it was very consistent in this one male over 30 days. So is this consistent over larger populations of male identifying people? Is this consistent across all ages or does it shift as people age? This individual was in their mid twenties. So is it well, some, this is a younger male who had higher testosterone in the mornings, um, you know, and how does this change when people are low testosterone and taking testosterone supplements or uh, hormone replacement? Um, how does that influence and affect and does it influence and affect things, these things evolutionarily yeah. and behaviorally from a, from a, a cognitive standpoint though, What's going on? Does it impact? Does the change in, is this a, is this a thing? Number one, is this a thing? And if it is a thing, does it change? Is this part of how cognition is impacted throughout the day? So it's, it's a one one and it's the first time. So we can disregard this study almost entirely <laughs> until they've done a larger well, replication of it. But yeah. But what I mean, obviously, to me, what like the obvious thing that I would first jump to is this is a the effect of sleep. This is this is what sleep does. Sleep, but does sleep re? It does. Does the sleep? It reduces the so you have low brain, lower brain volume, higher cerebrospinal fluid in the brain at night. You go to sleep, spinal fluid goes away, brain volume increases. Is it the sp the spine the the fluid pressure that's pushing on the volume of the brain? Is that what they're seeing? What's happening? Anyway, it's interesting. There's another piece of this though, and that is that the the adult brain is not done growing until the mid to late twenties. Mm -hmm. So if they looked at somebody who was mid twenties. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be end yeah. brain so yep. they would they would do better to do this again with somebody at least in their 30s to see if it was the same <laughs> right because no, that's, that's a fair yeah. point because uh, if there's one thing i wouldn't want to have to base anything off of it's a mid-20s brain <laughs> yeah <laughs> Get somebody who's at least a in their 30s. Come on. Get, get, get a younger there. brain, an older brain. I trust that's what the brain is supposed to be doing. Get 20s <laughs> brain. Yeah. Unreliable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Well, in this particular uh, write-up, there are other studies where they have looked at brains and hormones, and they've kind of started getting into this question of the the male hormonal circadian rhythm and individual differences between parts of the brain and those things but this is it's an area of research that it it's interesting and we should really be taking a look at uh, it's so many questions here as to how uh, how the male brain is impacted by hormonal changes throughout the day and then how that impacts behavior and what's going on mechanisms reasons anyway moving on from hormone cycles uh have you guys gotten in a slap fight recently so i can't say i have no <laughs> so did you I, know I, slap fighting's a thing yes i have i have seen it firsthand a few times i've never participated because because i don't know uh, for those of you who are not familiar it is where two people voluntarily take turns slapping each other until one of them says they've they've had enough, and then they, the other person wins. Uh, this is a professional. It's ridiculous. Sport. It's a professional. And they leave with a very red cheek, I would assume, right? That's the whole deal. It's ridiculous. It's a professional sport. No, it's not a professional sport. Yes. It's not professional. 
It may be yeah. sport, but it's not there professional. Is, There's there nothing is, professional about it. People are paid. The owner, uh, the CEO of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC, Dana White, has a slap fighting promotion company <sighs> called Power Slap. They've had television shows, uh, the first of which premiered in 2023. Three seasons later, uh, researchers at the University of Pittsburgh and VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System have taken the videos that are available and uh, analyzed the videos because they saw evidence of concussions occurring in these slap fights. Yeah. The rules. Of course, you're being hit. It's just an open hand in instead of head. a closed hand. And there you're, are rules, you're... okay? The rules. Two people, like you said, Justin, stand across from each other, take turns slapping each other, right? Slap as hard as you can. If you're receiving the slap, you cannot defend yourself, you cannot wear headgear, and you cannot flinch. So most people, if it yeah. gets to the point of hurting just too much, that's when they bow out or they fall down, right? They've been hit so hard. So uh, these researchers analyzed 333 slaps, concussive signs observed after 97 slaps, 30%. 56 contestants were viewed. 44 showed, that's 44 contestants out of 56 showed at least one sign of a concussion. 20 of the 56 showed Signs of a second concussion. Yeah. And concuss this contestants is, who displayed like, signs of a concussion a... lost the sequence 75% of the time. This is not a sport. This is a fetish. It this is. is a people, people are being paid. Sadistic audiences and masochistic participants. This is Idiocracy a, a, is real. A violent fetish. It is. Uh, not a sport. The bottom line is these are concussions. There's nothing that is allowed to protect these individuals from concussions. People are, you know, signing up to do this because there's money involved. Um, uh, and just understand as a viewer or as a person involved in it, this is dangerous. Concussions lead to traumatic brain injuries that can impact, uh, that can impact cognition can impact personality and can even lead to uh, to death. So there is a lot riding on this kind of a violent fetish sport. And um, the researchers are, uh, are, this is the first study of this kind of thing. And it is, yes, based on watching videos of the sport. Um, and they're now working on a study that's using mouthpieces to measure how hard a person's head is being hit and they're hoping they can actually study this enough to get some safety standards put in but it's kind of like this like you're going in to get slapped in the face and i don't know uh what oh i just invented a new sport yeah one fella puts his hand down on the ground and the other fella steps on it really hard <laughs> mm -hmm. take turns oh it's a new sport it's all the rage this is ridiculous ridiculous stop it stop yeah exactly so uh yeah. slap fight science now it's disgusting like all the billions of years of evolution and all the, gotcha. the, the advances in society and the knowledge that we've gained throughout uh, using a brain, and then this is how you've decided to spend your life. Yeah. My your question, brain in particular. Kyle Pettit is saying mouthpiece equals disqualified. So the question is, as this uh, research moves forward, will safety uh, be... In, allowed will people be allowed to have a mouthpiece that they can you know bite on so that it you know is there anything that they will be allowed to do in the study to protect themselves or is it just this is a slap fight and that is just that's all it is and you take it on i don't know what the what the rules are <sighs> but oh my gosh before you decide whether or not you are going to take part in a slap fight i mean that's a big decision right um 
maybe you should sleep on it. <laughs> no, don't, because first thing in the morning with all that testosterone, you'll be like, yeah, bring on the slap fight. Just before you go to bed, decide. It might be, do I really want to get slapped? You should ask yourself, you should ask yourself that, but you know, big decisions, you really should think about them, uh, especially when you're comparing things and trying to figure, figure a a deal out, maybe sleep on it. Researchers just published their work at Duke University in the Journal of Experimental Psychology General, and they uh, used a garage sale, an imaginary garage sale to study whether it's better to start with a good first impression or end on a good note. They gave people in the in this imaginary garage sale study imaginary experiment boxes that had unwanted goods, virtual boxes of unwanted virtual goods. Um, and some of the virtual goods that they uh, filled the boxes with were very high dollar ticket items at the top of the box. Others were high ticket items at the bottom of the box. Some of them were more mixed throughout. Some people were asked, which box do you want? Which one do you think is worth the most money right away? And other people were allowed to sleep on it and figure out which one they wanted. Unsurprisingly, the psychological uh, standard of primacy came into account and people asked, right now, make your decision, were more likely to make their decision based on the first things they saw in the box. So if higher ticket item items were uh, at the top of the box, they'd say, that's the box that's worth, worth the most money. That's the one I want. And they had a tendency to overestimate the value of the items in the box. Those people who slept on it were more likely to take a more considered view and often picked the boxes that uh, were more representative of, um, that had the items mixed throughout or were mixed or at the very end, the bottom of the box. When in reality, all of the boxes were worth the same amount of money, hypothetically, in this virtual situation. Anyway, it's an experiment that suggests Don't make your decision right away. If you have something to think about and a decision to make, you can get rid of the emotions involved in that decision or at least balance them out a little bit more by sleeping on it. That's great advice for a lot of decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Scientifically evidence-based now. (laughs) Before you send that angry email, just save it to your drafts. Decide in the morning. Your Mm -hmm. testosterone may be higher, but. (laughs) But maybe you will have a more balanced Mm -hmm. view of what you're about to embark on. Mm -hmm. There you go. (laughs) Yes. Stop impulse buying, everyone. Go to bed. (laughs) Hey, what are you doing here? Are you still watching this show? Do you know how long this episode has been on? It's time for us all. It's time for a nap. It's time for a nap. I think we're done here, everyone. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Have we done it? I think just for Mm -hmm. our audience's sake, so they can get a good night's sleep, we should let them go. Unless they're up in the morning just like you, unless you need a morning nap as well. And Blair, I do want to say I'm glad that you did stick with us tonight for this uh, very long episode. And I did let it drag out a bit because Justin didn't have a hard out. And because this is your last episode for the next nine weeks. Mm-hmm. No. And, yeah. yeah. Blair has uh, other responsibilities. So unless we figure out some other kind of interview or recording times for, mm-hmm. you know, for separate sections of the show uh, that can be edited into the podcast later, but are maybe live at a different time of day, just with Blair or whatever. Maybe well, maybe we'll figure it out. But as it stands for the Wednesday nights for the next nine weeks, mm-hmm. it's going to be me and Justin or me and someone else or me and Justin and someone else or Justin and someone else or whatever, but no Blair. Hmm. So everyone tell Blair you love her tonight before we end this show entirely. Um, 
And the great thing is, though, Blair will be back for the holidays. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. And then back for sure for our thousandth episode, mm -hmm. whenever we decide to do that. January, maybe? January? I think yeah, we, we should do it on the thousandth episode. Yeah, we should. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, or we could do it the 990 uh whatever the 999th September, you know what I'm, I'm having this feeling like maybe what we should do if we can't figure thousand? out the date right away or like what we'll be like oh 999 1001 1000 and then we'll be like oh no now's the 1000th episode and then we'll do that one as the big one <laughs> we'll like, do we do it on the eve show i don't know i don't know yeah, we'll figure it out. We're going to be making those decisions. Everybody let us know uh, what you would like to see for our thousandth episode, because that will be coming up in, like, I don't know, 12, 15 weeks, something, depending on shows, holidays, etc. cetera. But um, yeah. Okay. Let's do the end of this show so we can all have a good night's sleep and Justin can get off to a good day. So... Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this episode. All of you in the chat rooms, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Discord, wherever you are, thank you for joining us. All of you listening to the podcast later, thank you for joining us. Fada, thank you so much for helping with show notes and social media, and I will be in touch about getting us a uh, an appointment very, very soon. Yes, I know. Um, Gord, Arnmore, others, thank you for keeping the chat rooms nice, happy places to be. We like to be good to each other and say nice things so everyone feels welcome. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And all of our Patreon sponsors, thank you for being our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Eden Mundell, Alan Viola, Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gert, Street Smith, Richard Batch, Beb Coles, Kent Northcote, George Kors, P.L. Velazarb, John Rajaswamy, Chris Wozniak, Vagard, Shaftar, Don Earth and Styles, DK, Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reg and Shubu, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Arbon, Daryl Albaran, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hislo, Steve Leeson, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Ruppin, Richard, Brendan Minish, John McGridley, Remy Day, G. Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg, Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Nace, Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lon Makes, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Carter, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Ferraro, and Tony Steele. There was a lot of mushy mouths in my talkings of names tonight. But thank you, all of you, for your support on Patreon. And all of you who would like to be Patreon supporters and have your name mushy mouthed, please head over to Twist and <laughs> click on the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European Time, broadcasting live from our Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook channels. Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you uh, write an email that you're going to save for later after a good night's sleep. Um, just search for This Week in Science or podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on the website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, please let us know on one of our social media accounts. You can find them. Or send us an email. That's probably the best option. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be slapped into oblivion. <coughs> We look forward to discussing science with you again next week. And if you have learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming
coming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.